it's hard enough to have a successful boxing career. Nonetheless, become the heavyweight champion of the world during what most would consider the going era of heavyweights. But to do it twice, 20 years apart, at the age of 45, now that's a story so compelling that will most likely never be told again. Well, at least not in this lifetime. In the ring, Foreman was a juggernaut, a force to be reckoned with, a crown champion who never quit. Blessed with such destructive power, it only made sense he was favored by the gods. When Foreman lost his title, a part of his soul left along with it. They say it's lonely at the top, but it's even lonelier at the bottom. Time has shown that there are no country for old men, as aged warriors only live past tales. They say boxing is more mental than physical. Foreman embodied that philosophy with his display of perseverance, a true sense of self-belief and a will to win. To say the odds were stacked against him on his comeback was an understatement. There's two ways you can go about life. You can either complain and make excuses for all your pitfalls, or you can focus on your blessings and let that strengthen all your disadvantages. Age consumes a piece of us all with due time. It's common belief in boxing that one of the first things to go is your legs, but the last that leaves is power. Foreman possessed menacing power and employed it as the foundation of his fighting style. At this point in his career, his legs had to carry the excess weight upstairs, which made him flat-footed. Since Foreman was slow on his feet, he had to make sure the steps counted. This meant he had to truck forward and minimize any steps backwards. To be an efficient pressure fighter, you have to be able to push your opponents back. Foreman did so with the stumping jab. His jab was unique in that he would throw it with a lot of force, almost like a power punch. It often knocked his opponents off balance. This made it difficult to defend against with a constant threat from the big right hand. Which was so evident in his conquest of Sabri, Ireland. Foreman had overwhelming power, but lacked in the speed department. He made up for this with timing. When the opponents threw a punch, he would throw one simultaneously. Since he was physically powerful, he was able to absorb an incredible amount of damage which often favored him in going blow for blow with his opponents. Although wide punches were a part of his arsenal, Foreman also had tight, short punches. Since the guys blessed him with power, he was still able to rattle bones, even when he didn't have full leverage in his punches. There's a left flush on the face of Jimmy Ellis. Foreman throws a left right again. Ellis counters, but he is staggered. The damage also compounded for the reasons that it often caught his opponents off guard. Most boxers feel punches come before or after engagements. Rarely does it happen at the same time. So they are often caught off guard while unable to brace for damage. Also, take into account the force from the forward momentum of his opponent's engagements also accumulated the damage inflicted. With the exchange of punches, it's almost as if a semi-truck were to play chicken with the freight train. Quicker than he has been in his 19 fights of his... When you look at Bo oh, and there's a couple... Amazingly enough, he was going to get it anyway. He's risking everything. Oh, and there's a good right lead by George. Ooh. Oh, and another right. You knew you were in a fight when squaring off against Big George Foreman because you had literally had to fight him off of you. Foreman was an imposing 6'4 colossus that weighed up to 260 pounds come fight night, a literal monster straight out of a horror movie. His opponents often found themselves fighting for their lives. 
is exhausting enough him a sledgehammer's batter your guard. Additional to that, his opponents had to maintain a heavy pace just to keep Foreman from taking steps forward. If that didn't work, they'd have to rely on the footwork, which is even more draining with the weight carried at heavyweight. It was practically trench warfare. There were little, if any, time to think. You're practically fighting off of your instincts at this point, relying on muscle memory, while reminding yourself not to be so tense to preserve energy for the later rounds. But how can you remain calm and relaxed when there's a shadow lurking in front of you with every step? Foreman had the ability to absorb a ton of damage. He used this to his advantage by forcing his opponents into a tense firefight, a battle of the wills where not only would your uncanny abilities be on display to the world, but your heart and desires as well. What's big and powerful if you're unable to take a solid punch? In the lane of the giants, it only takes one punch to end the night early. In the 81 fights that Foreman engaged in, he was only stopped once, and that was against one of the greatest of all times, Muhammad Ali. Even in the fight, he was stopped more so from fatigue rather than pain. Foreman's iron chin was forged from fire. It had to be disheartening of his, his opponents to land the best shots only to see it didn't phase the juggernaut one bit. There was no way you'd be able to win in a firefight against Foreman, for the cane is fired at the walls merely left dense as it was unable to break through the barrier. The only way of beating Foreman was by outboxing him, while having to fight him off of you for the full duration of 36 minutes. The damaging cumulative long-term effect of boxing. It's easy to overlook Foreman's fundamental skills, even in his offense, since people so often only focus on his power. Sure, he was big and clumpy. Sure, he loaded up and often swung wide. But behind all of that was a calculated puncher that fired with precision. Foreman created his own openings even when his opponents held the shield high. They couldn't just stand in front of him the entire night because eventually the sledgehammers would begin to break through the already chipping shield. He was ferocious in his onslaught, often swinging for the fences. The style was very high risk, high reward. He had the chin to withstand the damage. Addition to that was a gas tank big enough to fuel his high punch output. So why not? It's now a matter of time. Foreman was renowned for being aggressive and powerful, who could deliver a rapid succession of punches with his left and right hands. The idea was to overwhelm his opponents with a flurry of powerful blows, leaving them little time to develop a defense a counterattack. There's another left that staggers Ellis. Ellis is one of the even remotely accused of stopping it prematurely. The jab and Shannon patiently stalking Briggs. A left that was short. Oh, and look at the left come up and slice the left. And Jerry Cooney's in big trouble. He's ready to go. And there he goes. He's got a minute and eight seconds left. Oh, and that's it. And I don't think he's The offense isn't complete without the body shots. One of Foreman's best punches was the right hook to the liver. The sledgehammer hook to the body often left his opponents incapacitated. A punch so destructive that it often left his opponents urinating blood after the fight. It was draining enough having to utilize footwork and fighting Foreman off. Add on to that, the body shots that further disrupted breathing. You'd be lucky to have any legs left in the later rounds. Nonetheless, any slaps left in the punches. We have a Foreman again getting in. George, we have come back. It's rare to see combinations at the heavyweight division, especially from a bigger one such as Foreman. Instead of throwing four to six punches, Foreman would break his engagements down to chain attacks. With the punches already moving his opponents back, each additional attack would further knock them off balance. 
How can you defend effectively when you're unable to properly plant your feet underneath you? The small pauses between Foreman's attack also disrupted the opponent's timing. When done effectively, by theory, each previous punch should create some type of opening. So say the jab forces opponents to pull back with their heads held high. He will be able to step in and connect with the cross up top. This didn't count the Atlas. Here we go again with the Atlas. Uh, Michael Moore is down. Go for time until I just started landing two many right short right hands right on the tip of the nose. And they just started hurting and hurting. And finally, he just couldn't take it anymore. I was going to belly bump him if he had. I'm not going to focus too much on Foreman's cross guard, as he didn't use it primarily in every fight. The concept was that it covered more surface. Since he was the aggressor, it was the safest way to absorb punches while drawing the attacks out from his opponents until they slowed down. The issue with the cross guard was that you'd either be on the offensive or the defensive, as it was harder to execute counter punches due to little vision as well as arm placement. This often causes a disruption in his versatility. It's easy to overlook the subtleties employed in Foreman's defense. Sure, he got hit a lot, but that's because he chose to. When engaging in a firefight, there's bound to be shots that name. He possessed the touch of death. Why not pull your opponents into a battle of wills? Foreman had an element control that is hardly seen in boxing. Although he had slow feet, he always maintained proper balance. This attributed to more leverage and control of the upper body. Foreman had incredible upper body strength. His forearms were like two big shields that couldn't be penetrated. Even with minimal head movement, Foreman was able to block the majority of strikes thrown at him. He knew how to cut the punches short by leaning into his opponent's punches he was able to deter the punches from following through, essentially attacking a railway to throw the train off tracks. Foreman also employed a very intelligent parrying game by focusing on his opponent's gloves. When he parried, he redirected his opponent's punches, usually sending it off to the side. By using his left hand, he parried the jabs. With his right, he used to parry hooks and crosses. His parrying skills were so good that it often made his opponents miss by inches. If the target made it to the punch, a lot of the snaps were taken off of the landing due to deflection. Another trick he often used was smothering his opponent's attacks. These defensive strategies were crucial to form his success in the ring as he was able to minimize damage he took while maximizing his opportunities to strike back.